Okay, good morning, everyone, um, and huge honor and pleasure to be here. As Jeff said, um, 27 years in the private sector, um, and that was no longer fulfilling, and so I thought, what would make me not sleep at night? And that was to get the true national picture on cybersecurity, and so I joined the National Cybersecurity Center. So as Jeff said, I'm gonna talk about the problem um, as it is, outline some of the challenges and opportunities we have, and then segue into some asks for you all here to help us. Because again, this is, this is a team sport um, against some of our Apex predators. So if you take three things away from this talk, it is these three things. How do we impose material cost on our adversaries? At the moment, it is too easy for them to operate with little or no, with little or no ramifications. The second is how we actually build evidence resilience. I am not convinced by a majority of the security solutions which are pitched today in terms of their efficacy against real world threat in real world operational environments and similar. And then the third is preparing for the actual when. And again, I think we have certain capabilities which are uh, designed to address the threat that we see it today, not that which is coming. And I think we have a lot of preparation work to do there in terms of the private sector, in terms of building both capacity uh, and, and um, capability. But when we look at where cyber is, you know, this video is always a good reminder in terms of where we've got to. You know, we are in a stage where Hollywood is now holly fact, right? We have um, actors around the globe who are able to conduct operations um, both here and in, in other territories against industrial control systems with real kinetic effect. And I think, you know, sometimes in our kind of Western bubble, we, we, we see Colonial Pipeline pops up, we see you know, the most recent issues around industrial control systems in water supply, and they serve as kind of reminders that there's a problem there that's full of latent technical debt. But they, you know, it's not in our face every day like ransomware. But we really need to be mindful that this is the world that we are potentially heading towards and the one that we need to prepare for. And this isn't to be alarmist and, and cause everyone to run screaming. But there are actors who are in open source documented of developing these capabilities in preparation for events of their choosing, right? And so that is why we need to be ready. So when we look at our adversaries, I thought I'd outline you know, a couple of reflections on, on why they are asymmetric in terms of their behaviors uh, and the like. So firstly, they're unconstrained. It's quite evident that uh, international norms that we would understand as a Western democracy is not followed by all people quite frankly, or all organizations. They are doing things where we look like, well, you know, that's quite brave, but they are operating because, again, they're working towards particular timelines or partic particular mission objectives. And that unconstrainedness creates the first part of the asymmetry. The second is their brazenness. It is quite clear the entire private sector cyber threat intelligence community could probably burn operations every minute of every day and they probably wouldn't care. They may change their tradecraft, they may upskill, they may make it harder to detect, but it's quite clear that they're not gonna give up through shaming alone. And so that brazenness again, you know, the things that we would reflect on if, what, if it happened to us, does not necessarily translate to others. And again, asymmetry point two. Third is quite clearly their technical capabilities are improving and are improving rapidly. They're learning, you know, and again, uh, they learn from our red teams because we publish an awful lot into open source and that's not to denigrate for doing that. I think that's a great thing. It is quite clear that they learn what indicators we're pivoting off in, in, in the commercial sector and trying to address their tradecraft to avoid that detection. And then the third is their overall operational sophistication. You know, it is quite clear that uh, the more insidious ones are becoming indeed very insidious. And the ones that we detect are probably not all the ones we want to. And so how we reframe the question to think about there are the things that we can find today, but how do we do true threat hunting? And I mean true threat hunting, not just running some IOCs over some network or some endpoints in order to identify the anomalous to find that golden thread that allows us to unpick it is a question that, that, that remains. Um, and again, I think the last point is, is that some of them have tactical initiatives. Yeah, if you look at the criminal ecosystem, it's just all tactical. It's all about the money. Uh, and they can kind of overrun us if, the, if, they chose, if they chose to. On the other end, there are those that are looking for strategic placement. You just have to look at the likes of Guam and, and similar, and you understand, start to stand the ramifications of, of, of some of this. So what would we prefer to fight? 500 duck-sized horses or, or one horse-sized duck? The wonderful thing in cyber is we have to do both because that, that is what we are facing. 
And that pro provides some real challenges. Again, from my experience in the private sector, you know, the red teams would always start being really sneaky beaky. But then they would understand if they were caught, they could just light up the universe and burn out the blue team. And that is a real consideration as we go into a period of increased instability. How do we provide enduring capability that can run for months or potentially years, rather than working in a period of accelerated crisis for a couple of months or weeks, which we're used to in traditional IR? And that's a real fundamental question, and I'm not sure um, we have all of the answers. So when we look at the challenges, we, we, we have many. We are really in the foothills of cybersecurity. You know, I always draw the analogy that we're, you know, this is like 1800s medicine territory. The industry is awash with quackery and opinion. You know, by Dr. Smith's magic elixir, it will solve all of your cyber reels. Well, there any actual evidence that it actually works? And we're learning all of the time. It's only taken us about 50 years to solve memory corruption. But we've not actually got the deployment out. But it shows you, you know, as technology is quickly and rapidly changing, we have still so much to learn. And we should be kind to ourselves, and we should recognize that. But it, but it outlines the enormity of the, of the mission ahead. The second is um, we have fundamental challenges around closed ecosystems at the moment where we, are un, we have an inability to either get telemetry out or introspect in. And that's wonderful for those vendors because they monetize that and they create their walled gardens, creates dwell positions for our adversaries who are able to circumvent those security controls and exist with impunity. And that is a fundamental challenge. Until we address some of the information asymmetry which exists in those ecosystems, we can't re realistically be expected to protect them, especially as pervasive crypts and similar starts to come around. Naturally, the volume of technology is not going to slow down. It is only increasing. It is changing very rapidly. Some of it's proprietary, some of it's open source. All of this just kind of increases the broad waterfront which we need to contest. And again, I've not seen any answers which show how this scales ultimately. The next point is probably one of the saddest, which is we have vendors who are willing to sell us service and then charge us extra to make it secure. And that seems inexcusable in 2023. You know, the way that the economics work in software development is you develop it once and, you, and then it all falls to the bottom line. You know, I've run in private sector businesses. I know how these work. So saying there is an enduring cost, there may be marginal if you're using SMS and the like, but there's not the sustainment cost that warrants some of the extra costs which are applied. So we have a world where I can buy a service that will take their money, but if I get breached, I then have to pay more to get access to the logs to understand what the ramifications of that breach were, or if indeed I was breached in the first place. And that is probably something that we need to address as a community. As I've talked about the speed of digital transformation and refresh, but what I'm specifically referring to here, there are industries, and food production is the one of the ones that concerns me, I guess, at the moment, are going through rampant digital transformation and automation, which is wonderful for them because it addresses their human capital challenges, but naturally creates more fragility in, in the wider national picture than we might have had before. And again, how we as cybersecurity professionals get in early there, rather than that us usual doom cycle, which is you know about 10 years after it gets mass deployed, they'll employ their first pen tester or researchers that then decimate the environment and have a black hat talk, mind you, so there are some upside. But you know we, we don't want to repeat that cycle for in perpetuity. Uh, we do lack good data. And, and again, you know, our, our society is wonderful for many things. Our free market is wonderful for many things. But one of the things that he's encouraged is data is an asset, and it's an asset with inherent value. And so by virtue of that, data is very closely coveted and guarded outside of kind of privacy laws and, and similar. And so the problem is, is it creates, that fur it creates further asymmetry of what really does work in practice, what really doesn't work. Because again, I think we've all seen examples where vendors litigate against independent third parties who are trying to provide unbiased assessments of technology. This is probably not a healthy or sustainable world that we want to operate in for, for the next while. And I think what you would understand is we have lots of lovely artisanal cybersecurity challenges, which is if only I can employ the $10 million team, I can have perfect security if my, in my 1,000-person organization. But many organizations cannot afford that. So actually how we take some of the things and we actually make them work in real operational environments at scale without requiring the top 2% of the cybersecurity industry is one of those fundamental challenges again, which we, which, we have overcome, which we have yet to overcome, although I will acknowledge that cloud is helping with that and the uniformity of some of those platforms. 
How we employ quantifiable cost on our adversaries. I'm not convinced that burning their infrastructure does much other than causing them to run the Terraform script against a whole new set. So, you know, thinking about how we dissuade, actually give them a materially bad day in the office um, is again unclear to us, both on a human level as well as a technological level. And, and again, I would welcome all views uh, on that. Some of you would have heard me speak about this before. I do believe it's very important. We're carrying egregious amounts of technical debt in pretty much all facets of technology across the globe. You know, we have learned a lot over the last 50, 60 years, and, and everything built in the last few years will be better, but we have lots of systems that are a lot older than that. And again, you know, it, for those living in the UK, we have obviously naturally a challenged financial situation and the like. We have compounding issues which are creating challenges around how we get pay down on some of that. All of that technical debt is, is an opportunity for our adversaries to dwell, to exploit, to do whatever they wish, right? But again, you go to the largest companies and it's almost an open secret about how much infrastructure they don't know they have or how much of it is unpatched or they've only focused on criticals or all of these other very valid business rationale things but we shouldn't convince ourselves that the world is okay. We have this massive, massive mountain. You know, we see the tip of the iceberg, but we have a massive mountain that we do not understand and quantify. And again, any offensive practitioners in the room, you will know that because that is often what you leverage to be successful in your missions. Uh, and this goes back to my other point, which is evidence of efficacy. You know, we have vendors which are still are largely unabated in terms of their claims. Um, without having to prove uh, otherwise through independence. And I think we need to really challenge that narrative. We have in other sectors, you know, where there's a uh, threat to health and, uh, and the like, and as, as cybersecurity becomes an intrinsic property of society, thinking about how we up that evidence base, that the thing we're actually going to do, the thing that we're going to double down on, the bet we're going to make, actually is going to yield uh, the results that we want. And dare I say, use things like objectives and key results even, maybe. You know, these types of things that actually, so we understand what we're trying to achieve. Before I kind of start to transition to the next section, I think, you know, systems thinking is, is, is a, it's a scarcity, I would suggest. You know, I think you've seen other narratives by other speakers in the past, attackers thinking graphs, all, all of those types of narratives. And it's very true. System complexity and, and systems thinking, we do not know how to do that at scale. We require really smart people that can work out data flows, that can work out logical trust boundaries, all of these things, but it is people. We have yet to automate that in any material way. We've done some things at a network level, but as soon as you go up into the application tier, if anyone can show me uh, a technology or a solution that can instrument arbitrary software that then shows me the data flows through that system, I will give you lots of money. Because the reality is, I've, I've pitched that problem to academics for over half a decade, to industry for probably about the same, and it's really hard. But unless we actually understand how the systems work, what is flowing where, what transforms are happening where, from end to end, how can we always reasonably be expected to protect it? And we have this desire for simple carbs. We just want a thing to take the pain away. Give me the one box. Give me the thing that will just solves all of my SDL problems, all of my pipeline problems. I'm going to probably be, you know, it'll probably be heresy. I don't think they exist. I think they may exist for some specific problems, maybe, but I think, that going back to the last point, the inherent complexity precludes lots of quick wins. We have to play an iterative plan here that slowly builds up the resilience in a concerted way to achieve the ultimate objectives that we're trying to do. So that was uh, highly motivating and not depressing whatsoever. So what are the opportunities as we go into the next phase? Well, there are many. You know, it's quite clear that, um, again, free market, is a wonderful thing. Legislation and regulation is a wonderful thing. We have a variety of incentives and disincentives which we can impose on uh, both vendors as well as um, end user organizations, as well as ourselves, right? And, and I don't think they're necessarily affected. And so, you know, uh, this is not government policy. I have to remind myself I have to say these things now. But, you know, one of the things I've said is we have R&D tax credits in the United Kingdom. Why wouldn't we consider something for cybersecurity improvement? HMT will tell me then why kind of cost of that is prohibitive. But you can see that it doesn't all have to be the stick. 
there are various carrots which we could employ should we wish in order to drive up ultimate resilience. Um, it is quite clear that the buying power of the market could unlock some of the points that I raised in the previous section. So unlocking that logging, unlocking that telemetry, unlocking the introspection. I, I stood up at a critical national infrastructure conference a few weeks ago and I said, like, if you banded together and you said, we will not buy your solutions, this is our common set of requirements, that would be such a strong signal to the vendor, vendors, um, and they would be remiss to ignore it. So, you know, how we cohere the voice of what is ex the accepted minimum now in these systems, I think we have yet to go. We do not want to go to regulation and legislation. That is a very blunt hammer. There are free market aspects here, so I encourage you all to band together, you and your customers, in order to achieve that. There's an opportunity for further transparency on behalf of vendors. And what I mean by this is we have a spate of vendors who have both an on-premises product and a SaaS version of that product. They are naturally encouraged to, forced to, depending on terminology view, that they have to disclose the presence of the vulnerability they patched in the on-premises one. I would suggest that they are not being entirely transparent always on if that affected their SaaS version for how long was it exploited and similar. So there's a set of behaviors here on behalf of software as a service vendors uh, and others where they could be more open and no one would fault them, but this is how we address some of the asymmetry in the, in the data challenge and the information and knowledge challenge that we have ultimately ahead of us. Um, I, I think, you know, I won't labor this point, but suffice to say, you know, making cyber a true science rather than what Terry says would be really good you know, and actually kind of providing that, that, that strong underlying evidence base. And, we, and we, we're getting there, right? You know, I think as academia over the last decade has materially kind of joined the applied sphere, we've seen some excellent, excellent work out of them, but it's not enough. And again, so how we as both a buying community, a user community, as well as an assessment community, drive the need for this evidence base. Um, on, on how to get there. And again, that is both on the technical, but also the human aspects of so the socio-technical sides. What really does work? Because again, I would suggest that a lot of our security controls, a lot of our resilience works until people are really stressed and they need to get something done. You know, and we see that through certain types of social engineering as that, as that evidence. Humans are gonna get more stressed. The world is gonna get less stable. You know, all of these things. So how we actually build solutions which are resilient to um, high cortisol levels is really one of the fundamental questions. Coordination as a community. Duplication of effort, we don't have enough off you. So if we all do the same things, we're probably not dividing our effort appropriately across the community. So, you know, obviously there are organizations like OWASP and similar that try to do an element of this, but really picking the bets, divide and conquer, all of those things is ultimately what we're gonna to have to do to have the impact that we want uh, to achieve our aims and outcomes. I would encourage you all, standards bodies, they're actually really important, it transpires, who knew? Some of our adversaries know this, who knew? And, and they're kind of piling in on those to embed into standards things which rep which uh, reflect their cultural ideals. As a cybersecurity community, our voice is underrepresented in those groups. I can guarantee it. So I encourage you all, if you have the opportunity to go along and participate in a standards body, please do. Bring the requirements of the cyber defense community into those rooms, point out the dangerous before it becomes a standard. Ensure that you have the capabilities you need in the standard to be effective in what you're gonna to have to do as you look to maintain and operate these environments. So, a plea, plea, plea. And I have to say, went on the journey of RFC 9424. It was a fun experience, thought, oh, six months. Two years later, it pops out the other side. So it's not a quick thing, but it is quite rewarding when it pops out the other end. Um, maybe to contradict Jeff a little bit, machine speed solutions maybe are a requirement. Because you know, we're gonna have lots of um, adversaries running at relatively quick pace at us. And so how we take humans out of the loop and we actually just address this stuff at near real time probably is a thing that we want. And I think you know, we start to see the emergence of that in containment, um, but there's probably more to do there uh, more broadly. So fundamentally, reduction in, 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 asymmet in the asymmetrical nature of information across the board would be a wonderful thing. 
How we do that, I do not know. I can observe that a certain country, not aligned to our ideals, started a data exchange where they were selling data sets, not in cybersecurity, but data more generally, that launched with uh, about 20 products in 2021. In 2025, they'll have 20,000 products with a net value of about $69 billion flowing through that data exchange. And so, you know, it shows that, that autocracies can, can do things and have advantage when they start to cohere their data sets. So not so we need to become an autocracy, but, you know, we probably need to learn a little bit there on the value of being able to get some of this information out across a wider population. Pull through of latent innovation. We have a lot of solutions on the shelf which just have not reached scale. So, you know, if you look at some of the programming languages that address memory corruption, some of the underlying hardware technologies that do the same, but there is, you know, I would say sub-standard application and portal of those more generally. And so how we get those into the hands of the users, into the developers in a way to displace is going to be one of those challenges ultimately ahead of us. Radical candor, as I hopefully am demonstrating, we should talk about the real problems that we've got because it's only through that, rather than saying, oh no, we can make it all fine, because I'm not sure we do know how to make it all fine entirely. I know, I think we can make the situation better, but we need to be able to have an open and honest conversation amongst ourselves and amongst our peer groups on what really is necessary. And, and some of that really will be uncomfortable, because again, um, you look at some of the socio-technical, so some of the human factors challenges, some of that is really, really hard. Uh, and I think we're starting to again see that with some of the hyperscalers who are saying, look, we can't secure this all on our own. There has to be a shared responsibility model here where, you know, I think you speak to some in cyber and they'll say, well, we can create the perfect wall garden and protect everyone from themselves. I'm not sure that's true. So, you know, an open, honest conversation with us all. Um, and then how we surprise our adversaries. At the moment, um, I think we're running a, an iterative playbook where we've kind of incrementally grown. I'm not sure we're doing anything surprising and novel. And I think um, you know, one of the ways you create people in uh, as deep minded and others are demonstrating, one way you create a bad day in the office for someone is you do something totally unexpected, as we saw in the Go competition. When they played against that human adversary, that was not a move that was in any playbook. And yet they were able to kind of they're able to beat the human. So how we legitimately do that, I'll, I'll lay that challenge out to you, but there is a real opportunity to that because things which are unexpected do cause people often to pause, think, and reconsider because the game apparently has, apparently has changed. So how, how we surprise our adversaries, uh, I look forward to your um, novel, if not terrifying, ideas. Um, so I've got some general asks and then I've got some, I've got some research asks. So the general asks, engage with NCSC. You know, we don't have unlimited people, but we do have certain superpowers, and that's convening, we have access to certain organizations, and, and, and the like. So if you feel you want to help, and you are in the UK, the National Security Mission of Cybersecurity, come and speak to us. We're very nice, you know, and I will help facilitate that. I won't make the mistake at the last conference I did this and gave my email address out, but you can find us and, and, and engage with us. And, and we will quite gladly engage with you and work out how to use your um, energy to best effect on, on the national problem. The next one is, you know, we are an evidence-based organization, and I think it, it's very much on our roots. We like to be right, and we like to have good evidence, because when we say things, we want to be able to kind of back it up. And, and, and I've, I've seen that in, um, in space since I've come in. So any insights you can provide us, any data you can provide us on where the real pain is and where the real challenge is, so we can then start to stitch out the thematic or draw out the thematic, is really, really useful for that. Because then we can look at all of the tools of government or the private sector, our relationships, other partners, and similar, on how we address those. But having a few voices does not help with that. We want to understand the at-scale problem as we kind of look at this. So any, any data, please do send it our way. Um, goes back to my point of preparing for the when. We, I think we are weak on instant response capacity and capability on a whole raft of systems. Operational technology is the one that actually does legitimately keep me up at night. I think we have pockets of excellence. Again, I just don't think we have the scale. I think that the technological waterfront is so broad that we know certain vendors, probably the largest, but we don't understand them in situ of the sector that they may be operating in. 
So how we build this up, and again, mobile devices, it seems a bit weird to me that uh, a lot of industry is relying on tooling developed by a charity in order to do forensics against an offensive commercial capability. Um, you know, that probably seems a little bit subpar. So there's a real ask here, how we do this and we, and we get that what we need preparing for that crisis point rather than someone writing some janky Python at three o'clock in the morning because the world's on fire, that would probably be ideal. I've mentioned this, but how we apply market forces directly, I think that will need cohering of, of various user groups, certain sectors to say enough is enough. I think the, the group that suffers the most arguably here, who needs the most help are the small medium enterprise. How we help them to get what they need because they don't have you, they don't have the sock. They are literally you know, navigating a world of, of bears and tigers on their own um, and, and that's really, really challenging for them. But we need to apply the market forces so those small, medium enterprises do get multi-factor authentication by default. They do get access to the logging, so if there's an incident, they can probably employ a specialist that may be able to help them. You know, all of these things without incurring extra costs, which they can rarely afford. How we bring scale to everything we do. Um, so one of the challenges I'm thinking about at the moment is the next version of active cyber defense. So for context, active cyber defense is the NAS NCSC's program where we effectively do things at internet scale or national scale to, to impose a degree of cost and disruption on our adversaries. The genesis of the ones that we offer at the moment are from about 2017, but thinking about what the 2.0 version of that will look like is one of those things that, that we're starting to look at. So again, I welcome your thoughts on, on what you think should be in that, but it, you know, thinking about population sectoral scale, not requiring more smart humans to drive the machine will get us to be where we want to be, not artisanal consultancy always. So the research asks, I, I could go on for this for hours. I don't have hours. I have indeed 18 minutes and 30 seconds left or less if we want questions. Um, but I've teased out a few research questions um, that I would deeply value answers to. The first is, how do we secure a legacy? We're great at focusing on the new and fancy. And, and that kind of, the, the thing over there that's slightly twitching, which happens to run a core line of business application, which we poke with a stick, we actually don't have good solution to that. So still it's the hygiene issues, asset discovery, sustainment, all of these things on unsupported platforms. How do we secure the legacy in a way which again does not require 15 band-aids and a plaster cast? The next is web security. If you look at the rash of vulnerabilities which have been exploited by various actors, state and criminal alike, they're effectively web vulnerabilities in security appliances on the edge. That shows how far we have to go. And, and that technology stack is, a, is an exemplar of how quickly it's moving. We've got great examples of how we know how to solve SQL injection or cross-site scripting or all of those things. But it's clearly not working because we're still seeing, you know, uh, I remember one firewall vendor that I dealt with in the old job when it was being exploited by organized crime turned out to be a SQL injection vulnerability. You know, we've seen, you know, various, you know, cookie leakage vulnerabilities recently and, 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 and. and. So how we solve web security at scale, and again, speaks to the last point, the legacy web tech stacks that we have out there, we do not know. So answers on a postcard, please. This is a fundamental one. The world supply chains are, tra uh, world supply chains are changing. We cannot expect them to all come from countries who are aligned to our ideals. How do we build systems we trust on things we fundamentally don't trust? Yeah? Uh, that, that's what we're going to have to do, be it at the silicon level, potentially at the software level, potentially at the services level, as we go into certain territories. And we, we, we mentioned this on our formal research problem book for those who want a little bit more detail. How do we make phishing a thing of the past? It's still a problem. You know, we introduce multi-factor authentication. People do kind of browser and browser style attacks to, to kind of get around that and, and, and similar. WebAuthn, Z may solve some of it, but I would expect adversaries to also um, show a degree of tenacity and creativity, be it red teams or actual adversaries in order to circumvent it. But we still don't know the answer of this. We, we, we're playing kind of 
squishy squishy on, on this. We've, we maybe solved it in email to a certain extent sometimes. People move to Telegram or WhatsApp or whatever else. So, you know, it's quite clear that we have a legitimately a, lot of, a long way to go in terms of resolving this challenge in a way which actually addresses it rather than provides point solutions to um, the example. This is my ultimate goal. You know, so naturally the UK stra the NCSE strapline is to make the UK the safest place to live and work online. My objective is to make it the most hostile place to target, infiltrate, and dwell online. Because I want us to really test, does displacement theory actually work? Um, and, and that is unclear, but if we can do this, we will, um, we will win. So that's where I will need your help. So as we go into closing, um, a, a few points to kind of cover off. So one is we should not tolerate seatbelts as a premium solution in cyber in SaaS. You know, I did the version of this presentation internally and someone pointed out that the reason that seatbelts weren't a charged asset is Saab had the patent and then gave it away um, and then that's where it started and then there became airbags and so they've moved beyond very much the basic. We're still charging for seatbelts and that probably feels an uncomfortable place to be given the state of the threat that we are facing and, and the demonstrated impact that that's having to, to large swathes of both the public and the private sector. Um, we need to find a way to sustain cybersecurity as quickly as the technology is changing. And I, I'll close with a real teaser as an example of that. We haven't found out how to do this. We seem to relearn every time. New technology comes along, well, we, we, we're going to, you know, AI is a key example. I had to say it once. I've said it once. But, you know, we, we've managed to reintroduce or security wasn't considered from the outset. And we have a whole new raft of vulnerability classes because the technology has radically changed on the underneath. And so how we actually do that in a way which is sustainable, unclear to me, but um, it is a crunchier uh, challenge that we need to address. How we ensure scale and coverage. I don't think observability is where it needs to be. And then obviously we've discussed the human capital challenges. Both are fundamental. Technology is the solution there. Um, but we need to break down some walls on the gardens um, and, and work out how to do this. But that, that is ultimately how we will win at the end of the day. And we should remember, our adversaries are very capable and they are constrained. We cannot be arrogant here. You know, uh, do the pre-mortems. What's going to go wrong? Plan for it. Drill for it. Work out how we end up with the least worst outcome. This is not a win or lose situation. We are in a situation where we can shape the ultimate outcome here, but it will require all of us. And you know, just look at how long it has taken us to arguably have some impact, discuss how much, on ransomware. And that's been, you know, it feels like a decade, probably about eight years now, and we're still not there yet by any stretch. So kind of thinking about um, how we are really going to contest probably some of the most technically sophisticated adversaries on the planet that can either buy or build it, and, and come after the bits that we care about the most it, it is one of those um, fundamental things that which we need to kind of wrestle with. And, and I tease you with this. So um, I looked at the agenda, and I, probably if my grep at 5.30 this morning was wrong, there's no talk on IPV, IPv6 here. Someone's scanning the IPv6 internet for a reason. Uh, so this was from an IETF presentation, which I attended. Uh, it was who is sc actively scanning and finding stuff on the IPv6 internet? Some people are. Why are they doing that? I don't know. But it shows you that there are inquisitive minds out there looking and probing potentially some of the newer technologies for intent, which is, which is unknown. And I don't think in IPv6 we have product maturity or necessarily the visibility you want, and it introduces some um, scaling challenges over our IPv4 internet that we haven't had before. The next one is, um, and I love this, Jeff mentioned it, disinformation and mi misinformation is a thing, but everyone applauds Finland. Finland had an existential problem, shared border of Russia, massive misinformation, disinformation campaign, so they went back to root cause. They went back into their schools, I think it was 2016, and did an educational program to change it at a generational level. And now, in 2022, they're celebrated as being the most resilient nation on the planet against misinformation and disinformation. This is big bets. This is what changes the game and the rules of the game. This is what causes displacement when you build in this kind of this scale of resilience. So their foresight and their willingness to take that bet 
and, and in, they, they've naturally yielded the, the, the benefit of it. So what is our cyber equivalence of this? And again, I'm not sure that we fully know. I'm not sure it is building more security professionals in isolation. I think I know that. So my teasing one before we go into questions. I have a wonderful job. It really is. You should all join government, by the way. You know, um, it's, it's really rewarding. So this is from a, an Australian company. Um, and this is our future. <laughs> so what they do is they grow synthetic brain cells. And they put them on an FPGA. And you can code them in Python. Yeah? So synthetic biology, silicon fusion, is coming in our lifetime, right? So why I'm trying to get ahead of this, because I can imagine a world where someone will come to me, and they will go, can we run a workload through this, someone in government? You know, because the reason why they're doing this, apparently the brain is at least 10x more power efficient than silicon uh, AI type problems. So there's an economic power advantage if they get this to work. Those brain cells, some of them last for two years. You know, the ones they've got in the lab. So how we think about this broad waterfront of technology and science that's coming. Quantum sensing is going to be a thing, let alone outside of quantum computing, and, 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 and. It's going to make our memory corruption problems, our web security problems, our another bit of Windows malware problems look quite quaint in the rearview mirror as we're tearing off into the future. Um, but, I, you know, I think th this is a good example of where I don't feel well equipped. I'm actually fortunate I do have a geneticist on staff, it turns out, because he was looking at um, DNA data storage. But I suspect many of you don't to understand what the security ramifications of, of this are ultimately in the cyber domain. So, in closing, impose cost, build the evidence resilience that we actually need, and prepare for when it actually happens. That is how we change the outcome and the inevitable. And with that, thank you. And for those of you, those are the teaser coins that we give away to vulnerability researchers um, that we recognize in the UK. And thank you very much. And I'm open to questions. Thank you now. If you would like to ask a question, I'm told, can you go to the microphones in the corridors? If not, we'll let you go and get coffee. There's a gentleman. Thank you very much for being kind, sir. How now, brown cow? OK, it's worked. Um, lovely presentation. I really appreciate you sharing with us today. Um, when I saw about your opportunities in arts, one thing that stood out to me is um, tapping into our wonderful students we have studying cybersecurity at the moment. I'm a mature or immature student, and I'm surrounded by excellent, mutable minds who are thinking in such a different ways. And I'm thinking, can the industry tap into their perspectives and experiences to um, do a more robust security system? It's a great question. And I think yes is the answer. I will say that I, I sit in boardrooms often and you go, we're trying to define the answer, but we don't know how new technology actually works because we're not, we're not living it. So your point, sir, is, is bang on, which is how do we bring kind of the understanding of the generations that are going to have to live with the aftermath into the decision-making forum it is bang on. So actually at NCSC, the way we do that is we have shadow management boards, which are more reflective of colleagues like yourself. Uh, and I had a grueling session with them yesterday on a management board paper I've got to present next Friday. So but I would encourage you all to do it. It's very levelly, I will say. So thank you very much for the question. Yes, sir. You raised a really interesting point on the leverage that uh, purchases have in CNI and OT and how we establish baselines that we kind of demand from vendors. And it's quite interesting to think about how those with the purchasing power could actually work together to create a set of baselines and try and drive those vendors. Just wonder what your ideas are on how you corral and herd those cats. That's right. It's a great question, and I think if I knew we'd be doing it. I think what my theory is, is that those are in regulated industries. Using a regulator forum to cohere around that is potentially one way and, and, and almost agree. Um, but I think, I think it starts with the first two, the first three, and then others will see the movement. I you know, what I do observe is in CNI specifically, is there is a lot more collaboration than I had maybe necessarily expected. So I see the trust groups inside the National Cybersecurity Center, which is the CNI firms for particular sectors. And you could see how, if they could get agreement there, I think it's, the challenge is always going to be who blinks first when the vendors say, oh, it's going to cost you more. And we go, no, 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 it's not. And they go, yes, it is. And we go, no, 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 it's not. You know, and I think that's going to be the real tussle on the commercial discussion. But start with your trust groups inside NCSC, peers in industry. 
get the first two, three on board, and, and then start a movement. There we go, start a movement. Yeah, there, there's a quote for the day. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, sir. Hi there. So um, when you were talking about dealing with legacy code, it reminded me a lot of certain DARPA projects that are currently going on on fixing these on a fundamental level. Maybe a question of economics. Do you see something happening like that happening also in the EU or the UK where lots of money is being thrown under these fundamental problems for more than four to five years? And no is the answer, I think, sadly. But yes, we should be is probably the... Is, it would be the answer to have, right? And I think you're right. You know, the US is is such a large market with such deep pockets and it has one vision. It's not really, you know, 34 children in a coat, um, you know, so which is some of the other trading blocks are. And so maybe Horizon 2020 is a way that we could potentially get something like that down and through in the academic sense. But I don't see that we have the same kind of long-term strategic bets placed at that scale. Um, and indeed, you know, obviously naturally the UK benefits from kind of working with both partners. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any more for any more? If not, have a lovely day, enjoy the conference, and thank you very much for listening. Have a great day now. Bye-bye. <laughs>